Hello, I'm Dave from DinoPC, and today I'm talking about GPUs. Today we are doing a super simple buying guide for GPUs. I'm going to explain reference and founders editions versus non-reference and non-founders editions, exactly what the differences are between them and which graphics card you should buy for which jobs. All of the opinions on this video are mine and may not necessarily reflect those of Dino PC. And there is gonna be a lot of subjective stuff in this matter, so please take everything with a pinch of salt. Okay, so we have this little space here free where the Glacier Don Saurus has now been taken away. So no super PC for you to look at today, but that's okay because I'm gonna be having graphics here explaining exactly what I'm talking about right now. First things first, when you buy a new GPU, you need to say to yourself, what job do I want the GPU to do? I'm gonna go through a few scenarios and give you some examples of what I think which GPU would be best for you in that situation. Let's take simple 1080p gaming at high settings, getting more than 60 frames a second. For those of you who don't know what frames per second are, essentially it's the amount of images that are shown on screen in one second that pass you by. So 60 frames a second equals 60 pictures per second flashing up on screen. The more frames per second you have, the smoother the image becomes, or the smoother the video playback becomes on screen. Console gaming traditionally have around 30 frames a second, whereas PC gaming, we love to have our super sweet 60 frames a second and beyond. All right, getting back to it. Which car would I recommend for 1080p gaming above 60 frames a second? Well, that would be simple. It would be the RX 470 from AMD. This card costs you around 170 to 180 pounds or $200, and comes with four gigabytes of GDDR5 RAM. This basically means that you've got quite a nice frame buffer to be getting along with, and it's also a powerful enough GPU that means you're going to be getting over 60 frames a second in most AAA games. This should be the benchmark and the standard from now on. 1080p gaming has never been so cheap. The good thing about the RX 470 is that it tends to get about 5 to 20 frames per second more than the 60 that is the sweet spot, which means even if you get into a particularly tasking bit of a game where there are a lot of things going on screen at once, your GPU shouldn't dip below that sweet 60 frames per second. Most monitors out there are 60 hertz, which basically means you can only see 60 frames a second on screen at once. You can't see any more than that. The exception comes when you buy a special monitor, a monitor designed for normally competitive gaming with up to and even more than 144 hertz, which means you can see 144 frames per second on the screen at once for a super smooth gaming experience. For this kind of gaming, the minimum spec GPU I would recommend to you is a 1060 from Nvidia with six gigabytes of GDDR5 RAM. The 1060 has just launched. It's a very, very good card. It's anywhere between £250 to £330, depending on which reference or non-reference model you get. Again, I'll be explaining that at the end of the video. In things like Overwatch, Call of Duty, and Counter-Strike Global Offensive, you're going to be getting 300 frames plus on Counter-Strike, around 130 to 150 depending on your settings on Overwatch, and around 110 to 150 frames per second on Call of Duty for the latest titles depending again on your settings. I'd recommend going medium because that will push you above that 144 hertz that your monitor can do, which means that you're always getting that sweet 144 frames per second experience. For those of you who don't believe, by the way, that it doesn't make a difference, I can tell you from personal experience, higher refresh rate monitors are amazing and they just require a little bit more powerful hardware to uh, get going. So what if you're after the ultimate 4K gaming experience? You want to be able to see on your beautiful new 4K television or your 4K monitor the absolute best of the best that these GPUs can push out right now. That is simple. You pay $1,200 or £1,000 and get yourself a GTX Titan X 2016 edition. This comes with 12 gigabytes of GDDR5X RAM, which is different to GDDR5, having twice the memory bandwidth. This still, as a single card solution, is not going to be able to do 60 frames a second at 4K on ultra settings. 
but you will be able to get over 60 frames a second with medium to high or high to ultra on some games. That's not what I would personally do. While that is the most powerful graphics card that you can buy that is geared towards gaming right now, I would recommend getting a 1080. You can still game on medium to high settings and get over 60 frames a second on 4K on some, not all, games. The best thing about the 1080 is that you can buy two of them for the price of a single Titan X 2016 edition. This means you can SLI game, which means you'll get way above the 60 frames a second 4K resolution um, that you're going to be aiming for. The problem is, is not all games support SLI. And if this is your first gaming computer, I would definitely not recommend going SLI right out of the station. Put it to you this way, I've been into my computers for years and I still only have a single graphics card in my PC at home. Two 1070s would also be acceptable here. Two 1070s are also going to be able to get you that 4K above 60 FPS experience. And that's where your SLI or dual card options end for Nvidia as the 1060 doesn't support SLI anymore. So those are some examples of the jobs of graphics cards and which graphics cards I would select to use for myself in those situations. But what about things like referenced and non-referenced designs? Up here you can see a referenced 1070 graphics card and down here you can see a non-referenced Gaming X from MSI graphics card. They look very different and that is true. And let me explain what the differences are. With this top one or this one that you can uh, see here, the blower sucks in air through the cooler here and blows it through the graphics card, exhausting out of the back of the case. This means you're taking air from inside your case and blowing it out the back. This is good because it means that it keeps heat away from the rest of your components inside your case, but it's bad because it means you're taking in warmer air from the case and pushing it through the graphics card to cool it, which is not necessarily a good thing. Reference cards or founders cards as NVIDIA call them are basically made by NVIDIA or AMD and they have no sort of outside help from FXFX or Asus. They just simply brand the boxes with their names. This whole card is made by NVIDIA. So what about things like this? This is a non-referenced Strix R9 390. And as you can see, it looks a lot different. We have two fans as opposed to one. It's not like an all-in-one sort of thing. You can see the uh, layout of the PCBs and of course you can see where the chip is if you look between it. This kind of a non-reference design is basically to keep the graphics card as cool as possible. It takes air from the chip and the rest of the board and exhausts it straight into the case as fast as possible. The downside with this is that it's going to heat up the rest of your components inside of your computer, which you may not necessarily want. This, however, is the preferred method for most gaming PCs. The reason being is because you care more about your gaming performance than you do the rest of your computer's uh, heat levels. And even though the heat levels go up, they'll only go up by a few degrees normally. Where it differs is in small form factor cases, like this one or this one here. You normally would want to have a reference cooler design because it means that you're taking air from inside the case that's already warm and blowing it out the back keeping the rest of the components a lot cooler in a smaller case it's a bigger deal than the big case if you've got a mid tower case or a really big case even like a medium to small case i would normally always recommend going for the non-reference designs with non-reference designs the chip is still made by nvidia they are still essentially the same product it's just different ways of cooling and you can have other features as well here, for example, is an Asus Strix 1080, one of the most expensive cards that you can get in the 1080 range. This has a lot of features though. It's got a backplate, which makes it look absolutely fantastic, which has also got RGB LEDs inside of it so you can change the color of the lights that are emitting from it using their Aura software. As well as this, it's got copper heat pipes to get take heat away from the GPU, as well as their brand new fan design and cooler design to make sure that the GPU stays as cool as possible. The reason why you want to keep your GPU as cool as possible is because of something called boost clocking. Clocking is essentially how much power you're going to be getting out of each card in very basic terms. 
You'll notice whenever you look at GPUs that they have a base clock and a boost clock. A base clock is what it comes at standard shipping out of the box. You may have a slightly higher base clock than this, but it will always be at a minimum amount the, ba the base clock of what they write on the boxes. Whenever you're watching Netflix or not doing something particularly tasking, that's the clock speed that it should be running at, or as I said, a little bit higher, each graphics card is different. However, when you start getting into some serious gaming, the boost clock kicks in and it ramps up the clock speed, basically turning the graphics card to number 11. This is going to heat up your graphics card, which is why you want some good coolers on it, because as soon as it gets to a certain amount of heat, that means that you're going to unfortunately have those clock speeds ramped down automatically by the card to make sure that it stays stable and that you don't melt your PC, which is good because we don't want to melt our PCs. Joking aside though, don't worry about melting your PC. These graphics cards are designed to get very, very hot. But if your card thinks that it's getting into the danger zone, it will ramp down those clock speeds and you'll get slightly less performance, which is why you should be going, if you can, for these bad boys. Obviously, there are other solutions as well. You can always water cool them, in which case you're definitely not watching this video because this is a beginner's guide video. What are you doing here, sir? But that basically is it. That is my guide to buying GPUs. Pick whichever GPU you want for the job and then look at the non-referenced versions of the cards, see which one you can get for the best amount of money. Most non-referenced designers these days have all got a good reputation. Zotac, MSI, Asus, XFX, Sapphire, all of these guys have very, very good reputations. There are thousands and thousands more too. Um, Gigabyte, for example, Pallet, Gamewood, all of these manufacturers have got very good reputations. So go out there, find which GPU is best for you for your job, and then pick from the non-reference designs which one that you want, which basically looks best, which is the best value for money, which has the most overclock, and most importantly, which one has those LEDs? Thanks very much for guys for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then leave a like because it helps us out greatly. If you didn't enjoy the video and you think I've been talking out my arse, then leave a dislike. But if you do that, let us know why in the comment section below. I'm trying to beat Silas in terms of likes to dislike ratios. So leaving a like is going to help me out loads. Thanks, guys. And um, well, that's it. See you next time. Because <laughs> we love our LEDs. <laughs> Silas, mm. what do you want in your computer? LEDs. <laughs> If you had a choice between like two graphics cards and one had LEDs and one had no LEDs, which would you pick? Uh, the one with LEDs. LEDs. But what's better than LEDs? I don't know. RGB LEDs! <laughs>